So today's lecture is on molecular motors. Uh, we're going to couch our discussion of molecular motors in the context of heart failure. So heart failure, I um, guess I should advance the slide. Heart failure is a pretty broad definition. Uh, it's defined as when a person's heart cannot pump enough blood to meet the body's need for blood and oxygen due to decreased cardiac contractility. It's a pretty broad definition, right? And so as you can imagine, uh, it, 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 it arises for, from a number, of, uh, a number of conditions. If we look at symptoms, uh, one of the primary symptoms is dyspenia. Uh, does anyone remember what dyspenia means? Yep, trouble breathing, shortness of breath, trouble breathing. Wheezing, also edema. Does anyone know what edema is? Yeah. Yeah, swelling. So it's actually the accumulation of bodily fluids, right? And so if I, if I am not pumping my blood, then you can imagine if I'm walking around in my extremities, I have the hardest time pumping blood from my legs all the way up to my heart. And so if my heart is not pumping properly, then I'll get pooling of blood, uh, pooling of bodily fluids in my extremities. Uh, obviously, if I can't transport oxygen uh, properly, I'm going to start experiencing fatigue and nausea, uh, impaired thinking, uh, and as a compensatory mechanism, we'll actually start generating an increased heart rate, right? And that's, a, that's an autonomic process uh, that in, in order to, to try to increase um, oxygen delivery to, to the body. Okay. All right. So again, it's a pretty broad definition. There are a number of different causes. Um, one of the top being coronary artery disease, right? So I'm getting plaques that are forming uh, in my arteries. If this gets to a certain critical mass, then I might actually have a myocardial infarction. Does anyone know what a myocardial infarction is? Yep. Um, a heart attack. A heart attack. Yeah. All right. So it's when I'm going to get complete blockage of one of my likely coronary arteries, and I'm going to actually get cellular death associated with that blockage. If I can't transport oxygen, uh, those cells will wind up dying. And so you get re regions of death and then, um, unfortunately, uh, um, life-saving repair, uh, but, but that actually hurts you as well. Hypertension, so high blood pressure, right? So if I have high blood pressure for a number of reasons, then it's harder for my heart to pump, uh, to, to adequately pump blood through the body. Abnormal heart valves, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Anyone want to take a stab at what the heck that means? Yeah. The heart enlarges, so basically there's more cavity space. Yeah. So hypertrophic is is hypergrowth. Trophic is growth. Uh, and cardiomyopathy. So it's of the heart muscle cells. Okay. So car uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Congenital heart disease. Congenital means you were born with it. Right, so uh, some defect in either the plumbing or the architecture of your heart due to a developmental abnormality. Uh, and diabetes, uh, which is uh, comorbidity with, uh, with heart, heart failure. Statistically, about 5 million people in the United States uh, experience heart failure every single year. About one in nine deaths, this is about a decade ago, one in nine deaths uh, included heart failure uh, as a part of the cause. So almost one in 10 deaths, a little bit, a little bit more than that. 50% uh, of people with heart failure will die within five years. Okay, uh, pretty, pretty bleak. Um, as you can imagine, with the numbers the way they are, uh, heart failure costs the U United States around $32 billion per year. Just to put that in context, I'll get to you in a second. Just to put that in context, the entire NIH, the National Institute of Health, where we all get our money to do biomedical research, the budget is $32 billion. So we spend as much on treating people with heart failure as we do for the entire research enterprise in the United States. Well, shouldn't say that. Biomedical, the primary biomedical research enterprise. So is heart failure something that would maybe like come about as a result of, like, for example, natural causes? Sure, yeah. So. So heart failure, again, it's, it's this broad definition of an inability to adequately pump blood, right? And so I will raise my hand. I have, uh, I have been diagnosed with heart failure in the past. 
uh, I wound up having an infection uh, in my heart. It's a Coxsackie virus. It's a really nasty little bug. It goes into your gut, and then it likes to go to your heart, and I wound up in the hospital for a while. And so, you know, so things like inflammation can cause uh, things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where these sort of stresses on your muscle lead to either hypergrowth, uh, or stresses can lead to uh, tissue damage that then follow up with, um, with cardiac fibrosis, right? So you get scars that form that are important for stabilizing the mechanical features of the heart, right? If, I mean, that's, a, that's a basically a very strong pump, and if I've damaged or lost an entire wall of cells and I pump again, right, and I keep pumping against those dead cells, eventually my heart literally explodes, right? And all the blood comes out. So your body has a natural mechanism to form very quickly a scar. But of course, the irony is that that scar has no contractile muscle cells in it, right? And so it helps save you in the short term, but it puts an inordinate amount of stress on the rest of the heart. And that's why this, uh, you know, 50% of people who develop heart failure will die in five years. The most likely cause is that they'll have a heart attack. Right? They'll have another heart attack because of all of the pre existing conditions. Right? So, like, I wasn't allowed to, I had a newborn, wasn't allowed to pick up my 10 pound baby for six months, something like that. It was ridiculous. So, uh, they take it pretty seriously, and it's a, it's a pretty bad health condition. Okay. All right. So, the prevalence uh, is pretty uh, geographically um, well represented here. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of the comorbidity uh, and associated pathologies with this disease have to do a lot with diet, right, and exercise. And so as a consequence, you know, I love fried chicken, but it's really not great for my heart. So uh, you'll see a lot of regionally specific uh, hot spots within the United States. All right, so that's the disease that we're going to couch this, this lecture in. Uh, and so let's jump now into motors. Why we need molecular motors, uh, what's the premise, uh, right? I mean, we uh, had a really nice conversation with uh, one of you guys in office hours about this whole acquisition, this whole usage of energy, right? Energy is the number one thing. So uh, why would we expend energy in order to drive molecular motors? And so I'm gonna take the next two slides and really try to describe why we need these things. Okay, so if I don't have motors, if I can't actively transport something, the only way that molecule A gets, well, mo molecule Z gets from point A to point B is by diffusion. So let's talk a little bit about diffusion. On the bottom, you see a simulation. This is a simulated particle and what's known as a random walk simulation. So this is a probability equation that says What's the probability of the particle moving one direction, you know, one spot to the right, to the left, backwards, right, and forwards? And so it goes through this simulation. And what you can see is if the primary goal, let's say, here's my mouse, if the biological goal is to get this protein from this point to that point, and it's taking this path, right, and then coming out, that's not the most efficient way. Right? But this is diffusion. This is what exactly happens in diffusion. Well, not that exactly. But, um, so if you actually begin to add up the absolute displacement, so I don't care if it goes forward or backwards, I'll count forwards as one, I'll count backwards as one, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If I start adding those up, what you find is that the average absolute displacement of this particle over time is nonlinear, right? So over time, it goes less and less. It, it travels less and less and less distance. Okay, so how long does it take to, for that particle to diffuse from point A to point B? And what we're going to do is we're going to use this equation, uh, the Stokes-Einstein uh, Stokes equation. This is Navier Stokes and Albert Einstein. He did more than relativity. Uh, this was actually work that they did in their graduate studies. Uh, and what they did was they defined this equation here on the right. This equation, the word is in blue, uh, and that implies that the, the uh, equation is in blue too. So remember it. Uh, 
But more, perhaps more importantly, what we want you to understand is the relationship between these various factors and what we call the mean square displacement. So x squared is the mean square displacement. And what that allows us to do is basically track particle distance not as a function of positive or negative, right, uh, directionality, right? So, so for instance, I don't want, if a particle moves one step to the right and then one step to the left, if I calculated that as total displacement, it would be zero, right? Because it's in its original spot. But the reality is that particle has moved two spaces, one to the right and then one immediately back to the left. So that's what we're looking for is the, the, the mean displacement, right, which means one, two, three, four, five, six. So even if it winds up in the exact same spot, it's still traveled a distance, right? Okay, so that actual distance that that particle is going to travel is proportional to uh, this top term, and it's inversely proportional to these bottoms. So what's in the numerator? The first is dimensionality, right? So if a particle is moving, has a far less chance to make, to, to travel a long distance, if it's only diffusing in one dimension, right? If it's diffusing along a line, right? And so these are this is effectively your degrees of freedom. So if the particle will move to a greater degree, a further distance, if it has three degrees of freedom versus two degrees of freedom versus one degree of freedom, okay? So this is the dimensionality term. K is the Boltzmann con Boltzmann's constant. So it's going to provide, it provides us a relationship between the amount of energy per temperature. And this is temperature in Kelvin, so absolute temperature, right? And it is defined as this term here, right? So energy uh, joules per temperature in Kelvin times the actual temperature. So the top says, how many degrees of freedom does this particle have to move? And what is the energy in the system? Obviously, if you have more energy in the system, there's a greater probability that it'll move further, okay? And, the, and so if we look at the denominator, there's three pi, and then these other terms are one, the viscosity of the medium. So the more viscous it is, the less far it will travel, right? You can imagine a nice analogy is like, if I'm trying to move through water versus trying to move through honey, or molasses, right? I'm going to move much. It's going to be. It's much more difficult for me to move through a very viscous material uh, than a non-viscous material, right? So it's inversely proportional to the viscosity, and it's also inversely proportional to the radius. So if a really small particle, it has a much easier, uh, um, so lower energy for it to move, right? So much larger particles move much less. Okay. All right. So the numerator, energy and dimensionality, and the bottom, how viscous the media is and how big the particle is. All right. And then obviously times time, right? The more time I give it, the further it will travel, right? Okay. All right. So some back of the napkin calculations, just for your information, the bulk viscosity of the cytoplasm is about 1,000 fold higher than water. It's a thousand more viscous, a thousand fold more viscous. So you have radius, are you just like assuming that any type of like macro molecule is like a sphere in this instance? In this case, we are right. That's exactly right. We're assuming that globular proteins are modeled effectively by a sphere. Okay. And so a, and how you might determine the size of that particle, certainly you could experimentally measure that with some pretty advanced techniques. But in general, right, you can think about a protein that is five kilodaltons, a globular protein that's five kilodaltons versus a globular protein that's 50 kilodaltons, right? You can make a back of the napkin calculation, right? You can estimate how the, the mean displacement of those two particles compared to one another might differ, right? And that's the level that we want you guys to be able to, to understand this equation. All right. So... Given that the cytoplasm is about 1,000-fold more viscous than that of water, and let's take an example where in a neuron, let's say you have a motor neuron, have a motor neuron that starts up here in my spine and it's going to run all the way down my leg, the axon distance, right, that single cell has an axon that can be up to one meter long. 
So if I want to get a ribosome from the nucleus, right, or the perinuclear space, all the way down to the tip of my, uh, of my uh, axon, it'll take 700,000 years based on diffusion. A little bit hard to envision how that works for biology, right? Okay, so it's clear now we need some kind of active transport mechanism to get things, whatever they are, from point A to point B as efficiently and quickly as possible. And that's where uh, we evolved molecular motors. So these, the next two slides are pretty much, um, you've already seen them, um, but I'm going to run through them once, once more. Uh, so just for your information, molecular motors are enzymes whose primary function is to convert chemical energy into mechanical work. And remember, mechanical work measured in joules, work equals force times displacement. Okay? All right. The chemical energy can come in the form of, in, in multiple forms. One is ATP. We talked about ATP aces and GTP aces. Molecular motors are ATP aces and GP ace, GTP aces. They're going to utilize those molecules, hydrolyze one of the phosphate groups off, and utilize the energy that's acquired from that hydrolysis to drive conformational change. Okay? We can also use electrochemical gradients uh, as uh, chemical energy as well for, for this. All right, remember that motion is always the end goal, okay? Doing work, force times displacement. This work uh, and this motion can, be, uh, can come in different forms. I mean, perhaps most obviously is a cell moving from point A to point B, right? We talked a little bit about cell migration uh, and the role actin cytoskeleton plays in that. But motion can also be the contractility or contraction of a cell. So a cell that's anchored at one point and another point, I'm going to undergo a motion, a contractile motion, in order to pull those two ends in. And you can imagine that's what's happening when we use our skeletal muscles, when we're pumping our hearts, right? They're not moving anywhere, right? The organ isn't moving anywhere, but it's moving with respect to um, within itself. Okay. Uh, the other would be the transport of cargo. And we made the, um, the example of a ribosome trying to go down an, an axon. All right, again, motors are matched to their tracks, right? And so microtubules are going to engage kinesins and dynines. Does anyone remember the characteristic of a um, kinesin versus um, uh, a dynein? What distinguishes the two? From the pre-lecture? Kinesins are always going to move towards the plus end. Dynines are always going to move towards the negative end. There's a directionality to them. Okay? All right. Actin motors, on the other hand, uh, are going to, excuse me, actin motors are described by this family of proteins known as myosins. And Dr. James, in the pre lecture, began to articulate some of the diversity that we see within that classification. There are skeletal muscle myosins, myosin 2, myosin 5. There are a lot of non-muscle myosins, and they're going to play a number of diverse roles within biology. Okay. This lecture is going to focus primarily on actin motors, and, and we'll touch on uh, the kinesins and dynines um, as well, but only slightly. All right. All right. So there are no mo motors that run along the intermediate filaments. Uh, why not? Yeah. They're not polar. There's no directionality, right? If you remember, again, go back to that pre-lecture and look at how intermediate filaments, we didn't talk a lot about them. But one of the things we did mention is that there's no polarity. There's no positive and negative end. So if you had a motor, it wouldn't have any cues to know which direction it was going in. And so as a consequence, we just simply have not evolved any motors. So microtubules and actin filaments themselves can, in certain contexts, be considered motor proteins too. We always put this in here, and, it, and I hope that in our last lecture, you understand why we say push in quotes, right? So, so I guess 
I'll ask, can anyone summarize why we don't like to say that they literally push, but rather they push in quotes on, let's say, the membrane? Does anyone, can anyone describe that process? Yeah. It's very, very close, right? So Brownian motion is occurring. Thermal energy is in the system. And so you're going to have Brownian motion or these thermal fluctuations. So the push is really a prevention of that motion, right? So if it moves out and I polymerize a chunk, then that membrane can't push, can't actually go back to its original position. So it's pushed out. Just be real careful about that, okay? Uh, they're not... Now, I will say if you have an actomyosin an um, machine going, then the myosin can certainly slide fibers against one another and you might get a push that way. But in that way, I would suggest that myosin is doing the work, not, not actin, okay? All right. So just be careful when we talk about these things like that. All right. So let's talk a little bit about regulation. Obviously, like everything in biology, if Myosin and kinesin and dynein were always active and always on, right? Our heart would be contracted and just contracted, right? Like we'd make one motion and then be there. So how are we going to keep, uh, keep these motors off, right? And only trigger them when we really want some kind of motion to occur. And there are two main approaches. The first is that we can leave the motor completely alone and we can inhibit its ability to interact with its track, right? So we can inhibit, uh, in this case, uh, this is almost only seen in striated muscle myosin. So in striated muscle myosin, myosin 2, it's always in its on position. It's ready to start undergoing, uh, to performing work. And what we're going to do is we're going to prevent its ability from engaging actin until we're ready to actually contract our muscles. Okay? So we're going to talk about that here in a minute. So this is a, a specific feature of striated muscle myosin, and we'll find this regulation in both skeletal and cardiac muscle. Pretty much every other mechanism is associated with regulating the activity of the motor itself. Right? So we're going to keep it in an off position, and some kind of stimulus will have to occur that activates that myosin, right, or that kinesin, or that dynein. Okay, so let's talk about that first form of regulation. This is really in, uh, important in muscle physiology. Um, and so again, this is the, the primary form of, contract, of regulating contraction in striated muscle. Again, striated muscle is that of your skeleton, your skeletal muscle, excuse me, not skeleton, and your, your heart muscle, your cardiac muscle. It gets its name from these definitive striations that were observed when muscle was first analyzed under microscopy. So you can see these striations under standard Brightfield uh, microscopy. Uh, and um, it's accomplished, this form of regulation is accomplished by inhibiting or allowing myosin to bind actin. Okay? And we'll get into how that, how that occurs. In this case, the inhibition is actually going to be relieved by calcium. All right, so I want to walk from point A to point B. I'm here, I am moving, I'm twitching, I'm, I don't know, nervously shifting my weight, right? So all of this is triggered, is a neural triggered response, right? So I want to move from point A to point B, right? And I get some depolarization of my nerve. I get release of ner uh, the neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction. And what's going to happen is it's going to induce this huge bolus of release of calcium from your intracellular stores, primarily the endoplasmic reticulum, okay? And it's this massive um, availability of calcium that actually acts as a, a means of disinhibition. So I wanted to find, anyone want to fathom a guess what I mean by disinhibition? Blank stairs. Okay. Yeah. Oh, one. Yeah, but even more generally, right? So we, we've been talking and I've had a number of conversations with you guys about 
trying to get some context of this terminology, right? So we have some terms that are really high terms, and then we have specific examples of that. So I would say that what you've just described is a very specific example of the process of disinhibition. So at a higher level, what, how might you describe it? So it's not activation. Activation implies that something is in an off state, and I do something very specifically that drives it into an on state. Disinhibition, what we mean by that, is we're inhibiting an inhibitor, right? It's a double negative. And so you will see this kind of terminology, and it's meant to distinguish the difference between an active, an activation event versus the inhibition of an inhibitory event. I know it seems like semantics, but uh, but the, the mechanism and the process is different. Okay, so disinhibition is inhibiting an inhibitor. And it happens a lot in biology. All right, so this is ba based predominantly on the thin filament. So, so let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of a sarcomere. So striated muscle are um, formed from many, many of these uh, structures known as sarcomeres. Those that have had physiology, maybe you haven't gotten to muscle yet. Um, what I'm going to do is blow up a sarcomere uh, in this cartoon here. And a sarcomere is defined by uh, this region between two Z bands. I'm not going to go into what a Z band is. It is a copious number of proteins that form this structure uh, that, um, that will act as an anchoring point for the plus end of actin within the sarcomere. All right. So sarcomeres are, uh, are made up of these Z bands. There is a middle uh, M line. That's what this is called. And then the filaments are really this thin filament. And again, remember that a lot of this is articulated when we had early microscopes, but we didn't have the molecular biology behind it. So they're literally looking at the filaments and they're like, oh, that one's thin and that one's thick. And then much, much later, they figured out, oh, that's actin, and that thick one is myosin. So the thin filaments are actin, and these thick filaments are myosin bundles. So from the pre-lecture, remember, myosin 2 has these two head domains, and it has a long tail. And that long tail is a self-assembling um, monomer, right? So it will form a polymer with many, many of these myosin heads on it, okay? The other term I want you to be aware of is this thing called a cross bridge. And the cross bridge is just the region where the actin and the myosin are overlapping. Okay? That's where the actual energy, right, the work is being done, is where those two are crossing over. Myosins that are out here, right, that have no actin to bind to, they can't actually do any work. Okay. All right, so I'll ask a question. Why is it critical that the plus end of actin, right, this is slightly different, the plus end of actin in this case is stabilized against the Z line? What functional significance does that have? Think through what you know about myosin from the pre lecture. What direction does myosin want to walk? wants to walk in the plus direction, right? So the significance of the plus ends being to the outside of that Z-line is as myosins began to move outward, the whole structure, the fibers themselves begin to slide across one another and the whole sarcomere contracts, right? If they're in the other direction, then when this triggered, all your muscles would get longer, okay? All right. Uh, just to really, just in case everyone always, well, someone always asks this, this little uh, curly Q uh, molecule right here that literally connects the, the, um, the thick filament or the myosin 2 bundle to the Z band is a protein called Titan. I particularly like them. They're made up of these things called fibronectin type 3 repeats. Uh, and Titan's really interesting because it, uh, these type 3 repeats that, that comprise this protein we're sort of like nature's perfect spring. So you can actually unfold them really easily, and then they will refold to their native conformation with almost no energy loss. 
So they're really the perfect spring. Uh, there's some really cool biophysical work that's, that's done on Titan. Um, all right. So let's look a little bit at this regulatory mechanism. We've got some of the anatomy of a sarcomere down. Uh, and what we're going to do now for the regulation of contractility of skeletal muscle, we're going to focus on actin or the thin filament. So here's our G-actin formed into a filamentous actin. Here's that, um, uh, the myosin filament or the thick filament. And around actin, what we're going to find is this, this um, one protein called tropomyosin, sort of this long uh, spindly protein that winds its way around actin. This is tropomyosin. And then what we have is this uh, troponin complex. And the troponin complex is really made up of three, uh, three core proteins, troponin C, troponin I, and troponin T. All right, so we're going to talk about how these are regulating myosin interacting with actin here in just a minute. So a little more about myosin now, and these are... Uh, the, the basic parts of a, of a myosin motor. Uh, we're going to have the myosin head domain. This is the primary domain that's going to bind actin. Right? And this is the main component of myosin that's going to undergo the significant conformational change that will drive work. Okay. Uh, two other um, chains right, that, uh, that you need to be aware of is this ELC or the essential light chain. The essential light chain is structural in nature. It's helping to hold things in the right conformation. And the regulatory light chain, as we've talked about before, the regulatory light chain is, this, uh, is the part of the molecule that will undergo a type of regulation, right? Uh, an activation step, a deactivation step. In the case of myosin 2, these don't play a major role in the activity of myosin. It's always sort of in the on position. But in the other myosins, this regulatory light chain becomes uh, far more critical. Okay, so how does this system work? All right, so tropomyosin, that little filament that winds its way all around actin, it in and of itself does not inhibit contractility, right, or contraction. What it does, right, more specifically, is it inhibits myosin from interacting with actin, okay? So we're going to harp a lot in this class about being very specific about your language, uh, and this is one of those cases, right, where troponin isn't the one inhibiting, right? It's not inhibiting myosin at all. That's where contraction comes from. It's inhibiting the interaction, okay? All right, so together um, with the troponin complex, uh, it will inhibit the binding of the myosin head domain uh, to actin. Okay, so what's in the troponin complex? Uh, again, primarily these three proteins. Troponin T is the tropomyosin binding subunit. Excuse me. Um, and this is, um, this is the bit that's going to essentially um, begin to link tropomyosin to the actin filament. The inhibitory subunit, which is thought to help position tropomyosin in the right location, right? So that it can block those myosin binding sites. And troponin C, as the name implies, is this calcium binding domain. <laughs> so T, so the easy way to remember it is troponin TN. Troponin T is the tropomyosin binding subunit. I is the inhibitory subunit. And C is the calcium binding unit, OK? So here. Biologists finally got it right and named it something easy to remember. All right. Okay. And again, just to reiterate, troponin I is thought to help position tropomyosin in its, in its inhibitory location. All right. So TNT and TNI together with tropomyosin inhibit myosin binding to actin. I've said that a couple times. All right. I've already talked a little bit about, a I've said the word chain, I've said the word subunit, I'll go ahead and say the word domain. Do we all remember what the difference is between a subunit and a domain? Someone want to share that with us? Yeah? Yes. 
Correct. Right? So a subunit is when you have a macromolecular complex. The subunit are individual, independent proteins that are working together to, to have some type of function, some major function. Okay? So a subunit implies a macromolecular structure with multiple proteins in it. Domains is one protein with discrete structural and or functional differences. Right? So a regulatory domain and a catalytic domain in the case of enzymes. Yeah. Could you repeat what troponin C does? Troponin C is a calcium binding subunit. So does it like, induce the binding of calcium or prohibit the binding of calcium? No, it's actually going to bind calcium. Yeah. yeah. And I'll expand on that here in just a minute. OK. What does chain tell us? If I say, oh, this is the light chain, what does that tell us about the structure of the protein? Nothing. Tells us nothing. Remember, chain is a, chain is a descriptor right, from some type of experimental process. Right? In the case of these light chains and heavy chains, it's that when they were trying to analyze the protein, they likely used some type of enzyme to degrade the protein to resolve it on a polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And they said, oh, look, there's a big part and a little part, a heavy chain and a light chain. Remember, chain doesn't in and of itself determine structure, doesn't give you any structural information. It may be that a chain is the same size as the domain, right? But that would be, they don't always go together, right? So don't uh, infer uh, any kind of information from chain other than it's some, something that was pulled out during an experimental process. All right. So 2015, we finally crystallized this structure, uh, pieced together, I guess, multiple crystal structures. Uh, so here in gray, you see the actin filament is there. This is tropomyosin. This is the calcium binding domain and troponin I and T here. And in this little spot right here, if we look at troponin C, this is the calcium binding site. Okay? So this is what it really, really looks like. Okay. So how does calcium then activate muscle contraction? Okay. So we talked about the fact that you have some type of neural transmission. You get neurotransmitters at the neuromuscular junction that impact that muscle cell and release calcium. It triggers a release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. So now I have copious amounts of calcium in the cytosol and it can now bind troponin C. All right. So it's going to bind troponin C. There are two theories. It's a classical theory which, as the name implies, is a little bit older, and, and there's a, a more modern theory. So in the classical theory, uh, there's a conformational change uh, in troponin C upon its binding to calcium that is transmitted, I right, love these quotes, into troponin T and troponin I. And the key term here is to actively move tropomyosin off the myosin bridge. So it would be like, I'm going to undergo a conformational change and push this table away. Okay, that's the classic. Is that it's literally pushing, it's doing work itself, right? To move this uh, tropo, uh, tropomyosin uh, fiber off of the myosin binding site. So what that would look like is, let's say these blue lines are, uh, are the, the dark blue dots are where myosin needs to bind actin. And tropomyosin is now here obviously covering them up. Troponin C, you get a calcium efflux. Troponin C will bind that calcium, induce a conformational change, and push that fiber off. Okay? And now myosin, you can see, now myosin can come in and bind. There's a newer theory, which in all likelihood, given everything that we've talked about, I'm guessing or I'm hoping you guys would probably agree is a little, a little more closer to the truth. Um, that's my own personal, these are theories, so we don't know is that troponin I actually locks tropomyosin to actin. So it's going to anchor it. And when calcium is present and binds to troponin C, that it's unlocked and free to diffuse. Right? So instead of pushing it, 
I'm going to kind of let go of it. Now, troponin, right, is wound, tropomyosin is wound around actin. So it's not going to completely diffuse away, right? But what it will do is be impacted by what? What have we talked about very recently in this class when it comes to motion and... Yes, Brownian motion, right? So now there's thermal energy in the system and this fiber, right, this tropo, uh, tropomyosin is going to undergo a type of Brownian motion, right? It's going to start wobbling, right? So now it wobbles and the cooperative binding of myosin now, right? So I'm exposed, I'm hidden. I'm exposed, I'm hidden. I'm exposed, I'm hidden. But the myosin is also trying to bind it actively at all times, right? Because it's always on. Right? Myosin is always on in skeletal muscle. So the minute it becomes exposed and myosin combined, now that displacement is stabilized. Right? And now, once one myosin binds, other myosins can bind because it's, it's displaced that, uh, that entire fiber. Okay. So the entire pathway in one slide. Calcium is released from intracellular stores. It's going to bind troponin C. Tropomyosin is unlocked, so you can even see, like this is, I'm sorry, this is our, uh, our biases already entering into this slide as opposed to being pushed off. Tropomyosin is unlocked from the myosin binding sites on actin, and myosin is now free to bind. But it's likely some type of competitive, competitive binding. Okay. All right. So now we got all those slides to get us to the point where myosin is now bound to actin. Now, how do we actually generate work? How do we actually generate uh, um, muscle contraction? And to do this, uh, to, to, um, to explain this, we're going to describe this thing called the actin-myosin cross-bridge cycle. This is the cycle of conformational changes that myosin is going to undergo where the thin filaments and the thick filaments are overlapping. This is where we get uh, that, that work being done. All right. So we're going to assign this position here, right here, here's actin, here's the myosin, and the myosin is in a state where it is bound both to actin and it is binding to ADP, adenosine diphosphate. We're going to call this step one, and there's a reason for it. It's also called the rigor state. Anyone want to fathom a guess why it might be called the rigor state? Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. So when you die, this is where the cycle ends, right? So when all my ATP is bound, is, is, has been consumed, the myosin is found in this configuration. It's in this sort of locked position, right? And your muscles get really tense, and it gets really hard to move people around. All right. So we're going to call that step one. It comes from rigor mortis. And it was the originally defined position of myosin because all we had was dead muscle tissue to examine. Okay? All right. So step two. Step two is going to be this release of ADP. Okay? So we're going to get rid. We're going to shed that ADP. Remember, all these ATPases and GTPases, they're not phosphorylating. <laughs> Right? They're not phosphorylating ADP to get to ATP. They're shedding ADP, and they're picking up a new, fresh ATP. Right? So that's starting this process. So ADP is shed. It's still bound to myosin, and it's still in that same conformation. Right? However, when I now bind ATP, so ATP is going to bind, and upon ATP binding, we change the conformation of the head domain. So now it's less favorable to bind at, so it releases. Right? So in the ATP bound state, <coughs> myosin, myosin's affinity for actin goes down. So it comes off. All right? Step four is a really interesting step, all right? because what's happening now is myosin is an ATPase. So it's going to hydrolyze ATP into ADP plus inorganic phosphate but it's not going to completely get rid of the inorganic phosphate. So it's going to break the bond, and in breaking the bond, what it does 
is it starts to facilitate its binding, right? The ADP myosin is a high affinity state for acne. The ATP is a lower affinity state. So by breaking that bond, that myosin is in this intermediate state where it's ADP bound, but it still has that inorganic phosphate that's been released. So it's still holding on to it. Okay. So what that hydrolysis is going to do is it's going to cock, cock the, uh, the protein. So here I want you to look at this conformation, right? So if this is the fibrillar part of the myosin and it's in this state here, then when I hydrolyze that AD, ATP into ADP plus inorganic phosphate, it undergoes a conformational change. And now it's going to start trying to bind, okay? So that's what it's doing. So it, it changes the conformation, it binds, and now we get the money step, the power stroke. So step number five is called the power stroke. So you can think about this. I've got ADP bound, and I've got that inorganic phosphate that's still associated with the protein. The minute that inorganic phosphate is shed, right, or unbind, that's another event. I've now lost all that negative charge, right, and what's likely going to happen? Conformational change, right? So we have another conformational change. In this case, it's in the bound state, and it's going to undergo this power stroke, right? So we're back to the rigor state. Okay, so the motor takes one step, and inorganic phosphate is released. Okay? Definitely know this. <laughs> All right. What I will say is that um, the rate limiting step is really this step right here, right? The binding. Because the, while the ADP, ADP myosin has a high affinity, this isn't quite ADP myosin, right? It's ADP myosin plus this inorganic phosphate that's still sort of hanging around. So this binding step right here is the rate limiting step of the whole process, okay? All right, I already mentioned this. The consequence of all these actions is that the sarcomere shortens, right? Because they're moving, the myosins are walking, so you can think about it like a wrench, right? They're wrenching in the, my, the actin towards itself, right? Okay, so you would consider that a me the mechanism there is that of sliding fibers. One fiber sliding against another, right? And in this way, shortening, shortening the sarcomere, shortening the muscle, muscle cell, and generating work. Another example of sliding filaments is that of microtubules in flagella and cilia. They're going to use that specialized dynein that, that um, Kevin mentioned in the pre-lecture called axonemal dynein. And what they're going to do is those dynings are going to cause a sliding of microtubules across one another. And we're not going to go into this uh, in any detail other than to say that if you have two um, microtubules that are anchored on one end and you start trying to slide one against the other, then you generate a bending force, right? And so that's what these are going to do. They're going to generate a bending force as they try to move one slide, one fiber, micro, um, um, excuse me, um, why does my brain do this? Uh, micro, microtubule against one another. Okay. All right. So the regulation of contraction in smooth muscle cell is really representative of pretty much all other myosins and all other non-muscle myosins and non-muscle cells. Okay. They do have what's known as thick filaments and thin filaments. This is a vain attempt on the part of cell anatomists back in the day. Because it is a muscle cell, they wanted to assign similar names to similar types of structures. The thick filament is essentially a myosin bundle. Okay, It's not a myosin filament. It's going to be more like a myosin bundle. And the thin filament is exactly the same. It's actin filaments. And it will induce sort of um, uh, actin sliding, filament sliding across one another. Uh, its impact is, is slightly different, right? So if these two, if these fibers are sliding, you're still shortening those distances. 
and you get this global cellular contraction. It's based predominantly uh, in the myosin, the, the regulation of it, and not in the thin filament. So in this case, we don't have triple myosin binding up myosin binding sites, right? It's more about our ability to regulate the activation state of myosin. So this is not disinhibition. And it's accomplished in smooth muscle cells um, uh, and other cells by the phosphorylation of that regulatory light chain. Okay? So as the name implies, the regulatory light chain is where we're going to get regulation. All right. So we're almost done. That's good because we only we're almost done with time too. Um, so the regulation of contraction in smooth muscle cells, uh, let's see, uh, is going to look like this. So here we have a little video. Smooth muscle myosin is activated by the phosphorylation of that regulatory light domain. So I'm going to blow this little area up right here. Structurally, it looks like this. So here's the motor domain, the head domain, right? Here's that essential light chain here in green and the regulatory light chain in purple, I guess, or dark blue, okay? All right, so again, essential chain is uh, providing structural information, right, structural support, and the regulate, um, this domain um, is gonna provide the regulatory impact, all right? So upon phosphorylation of threonine and serine in positions 18 and 19, usually in a calcium dependent manner, so the kinases that are upstream of myosin light chain that are going to phosphorylate that are activated most often by calcium. Not all, always, right? So there are actually calcium independent myosin light chain kinases. One that you may eventually read about is integrin link kinase. Okay, and so that one does not require calcium, but many of them do. And historically, it's been a calcium mediated activation event of upstream kinases. So the regulation um, by phosphorylation requires a kinase and a phosphatase, right? So if I want to regulate the activation state of myosin, I need to add phosphate groups to activate it. That turns it on. But I don't want it on all the time. So I'm going to have a phosphatase. And what phosphatases do is remove phosphate groups. So depending on my relative balance of active kinases and active phosphatases, those determine the activation state of myosin. And so what we'll do is we actually won't measure, most times, the phosphorylation of myosin. We'll look at how much myosin light chain kinase there is and how much, I mean active, and how much active myosin light chain phosphatase there is. And we'll take a ratio of those as an approximation of what the activation state is of myosin, okay? All right, so phosphorylation and one example, uh, in this case of smooth muscle myosin. So don't take this cartoon literally, right? These aren't the exact conformational changes that are occurring, but what will happen in the case of non-muscle myosins is we get some type of phosphorylation event of that regulatory chain, <laughs> And like everything else that we talk about, it's like getting a little bit boring now, right? You get a chemical modification that causes a conformational change, and that is either an activating event in this case or a deactivating event. We get some type of conformational change. All right. In the case of kinesin and dynein, right, um, it actually can be that the binding of the cargo to that, uh, to that um, motor protein is the activation step. Okay, so here's our cargo, it's a vesicle. It binds the cargo binding domain, that purple heart, right? That causes a conformational change and you get then the exposure and activation of those myosin head domains, okay? What is this an example of? One of those big terms that we've talked about. Some kind of regulation. I'm hearing whispers that are sound correct. What? Allostery, right? Action from a distance, right? It's binding a site that's distant from the myosin head domain, which is the active site, and you're inducing an activation of it in this case, right? 
Allosteric can also be inhibitory, right? So remember, this is one of those big terms that sits above these various examples. Okay, so in the last minute, what happens in heart failure? Well, we get reduced myocardial contraction because we lose cardiomyocytes. You have a heart attack. You get changes in tissue integrity. I have fibrosis following a heart attack. I have reduced availability of ATP. I either have impaired uh, calcium recycling or I have some major sarcomeric abnormalities, right? All of these things will lead to a reduced ability for contraction. So what do we do about it? Well, it's remarkably difficult, not impossible, but remarkably difficult to actually get cardiomyocytes to regenerate. They actually are post-mitotic in adults. They don't like to undergo division, right? I have a lot of people trying to work on it, some people here at UVA as well. Um, it's very difficult. So if you can't restore lost cells, then what you can do is make the cells that are there a little bit better, right? This is like the Captain America of, uh, you know, just pump them up with something and then make them a little bit stronger. All right. So what we're going to do here with this molecule here, uh, omicamtiv marcarbil, is we're going to increase the rate of force generation. We can't change the amount of force that they generate, but we can increase that cycle that we talked about uh, and speed it up. So this is going to bind cardiac myosin allosterically and increase the transition rate of myosin to its force generating state. What that means is that I told you this was the rate limiting step, this ability to get myosin in this ADP PI state to bind. And what we're going to do is we're going to speed that process up. So here's a little video. This is a beagle, and they're looking at uh, increasing cardiac output. And so this beagle has, has been, um, it's been given basically a heart attack, right? An experimentally induced heart attack. I know, it sounds awful. And they're going to give it either nothing or this drug. And what you'll find is that when we talk about cardiac output, what we're talking about is the amount right, the amount of volume that it can push, right? And that's characterized by uh, doing this type of analysis where we're looking at how much volume it can squeeze out. This is volume of blood, right? And it's squeezing out, squeezing out blood, okay? So if you can't, can't restore heart cells, make them, make them better. All right, folks here at UVA, they're doing this. They're all over, down, actually, on the first floor of MR5, within the BME, Jeff Saucerman, Will Guilford, doing this kind of stuff. All right. <laughs>